Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining this session. It's my great pleasure to introduce Central Work here today. So this is a new series we will set up, have set up here in Munich, the Munich AI Lectures. This is a joint initiative between the two universities, FUM and LMU Munich, also the Helmholtz AI, specifically of the Munich Data Science Institute, the Munich Center of Machine Learning, and the LS Unit, and the Center of Advanced Study at LMU. So we really want to bring world-class experts here at this lecture series under one roof in the entire Munich ecosystem. And it's really my great pleasure to introduce here today as our first keynote speaker, Cynthia Dwork. She is a professor at the Computer Science Department at Harvard, also affiliated with the Harvard Law School, and she's a distinguished scientist at Microsoft. She's specifically well known for her work on privacy preserving data analysis and has made uh, seminal contributions in cryptography, distributed computing, and many, many more great achievements. Specifically, she also contributed a lot to the fairness uh, in machine learning. And this is also the uh, one part of her presentation today. So Cynthia will talk about fairness, randomness, and the crystal ball. Cynthia, I would like to hand over the microphone to you and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak and to be the inaugural speaker in what I hope will be a very exciting series of lectures at Munich. Um, you can all hear me? Yes, we can hear you and everyone else should please turn off the microphone. Okay. So I'm just going to rearrange my desk for a second. Uh, so I'll be a little more comfortable standing. Good. Um, all right. So I'm going to do something today that I've never done, which is I, I found that I simply could not deliver exactly the talk that I had planned because I've been thinking about these things so much lately that uh, my mind was crowded with, with sort of these new pieces that I wish to integrate. So on relatively little notice, I'm integrating some new material here. Bear with me, it won't be as polished, but it will be much more heartfelt. Um, so in her absolutely clairvoyant article from 1979, Barbara Underwood, who is now the Solicitor General of the state of New York, discussed the use of what she called individualized or clinical decision-making versus the use of statistical inference in what she describes as two different ways of approaching the task of moving from evidence to facts. And she points out that that task presents similar problems, whether the facts are to be found in the past or the future. So if you think about the use of artificial intelligence for uh, determining whether somebody should be imprisoned or not imprisoned, imagine its use for determining whether they were guilty or not guilty of a crime. Now, algorithmic predictors are increasingly being used to score individuals. And as Underwood notes, important benefits and burdens are distributed in society on the basis of these predictions, including release from prison, placement in schools, jobs, and the granting of retail credit. And so of course, there's enormous uh, concern that they be fair. Now, the study of the theory of algorithmic fairness was launched in the summer of 2010 at Microsoft's Silicon Valley Research Lab. And we began following a paradigm that was established in cryptography. We began with definitions because without definitions, we literally do not know what we're talking about. And uh, we identified two major flavors of definitions of fairness. Um, what we called group fairness and individual fairness. And this dichotomy echoes precisely the dichotomy of statistical inference versus individualized or clinical um, uh, uh, predictions that was discussed in Underwood's paper. Now, group fairness guarantees require some kind of relationships between certain statistics of decisions about typically large demographic groups. So for example, statistical parity says that the demographics or the makeup 
of the accepted students at a university should be the same as the population as, uh, as a whole. While uh, balance for the positive class is a notion that says that if you're scoring, the average score for a positive member of group A should be the same as the average score for a positive member of group B. Now, group fairness notions fail under scrutiny. So for example, a steakhouse that shows advertisements to the vegetarians in group A and the meat eaters in group B may be demographically fair, that is showing the ad to the same numbers of people in A as in B, but it will um, still result in a restaurant that caters principally to members of group B. Or the hiring of uh, minority candidates might be skewed and it might reward the more assimilated members of the minority group or the people in the minority who dress like, act like, have the same hobbies as members of the majority. Um, there's a, a recurring theme in today's conversation is going to talk about which groups should be considered when you talk about group fairness. We're going to spend a lot of time on that as we move forward. And uh, uh, early work did not handle questions of intersectionality, um, um, which is of course quite important now. It's also surprisingly difficult to test an algorithm for group fairness, even under very, very uh, simple assumptions and conditions. And a compelling uh, article in the Annual Review of Criminology by Neil and Winship argues that standard benchmark and outcomes tests typically produce invalid inferences that in their words may diverge from reality in either direction, indicating discrimination when it is not present or alternatively indicating a lack of discrimination when it is in fact present. And finally, uh, sets of two or three group fairness desiderata can be provably impossible to satisfy simultaneously, even for only the case of two disjoint groups A and B, unless the base rates are the same in the two groups. And for me, this last result was sort of a serious nail in the coffin. So what is individual fairness, our other option? Individual fairness says that people who are similar with respect to a given classification task should be treated similarly by a classifier for that task. And of course, the same thing for a scoring function. So uh, that people who are similar with respect, I'm sorry, that the people who are similarly situated should be treated similarly is a pervasive notion in law. And this framework is very powerful, but it requires a task specific metric for each classification or scoring task. So in other words, we need some way of determining for the particular task at hand, just given a pair of people, how similar or dissimilar they are for this particular task. And this need for a metric uh, kind of brought this direction of work to, to a hold for a while, but uh, recent years has seen quite a bit of progress along these lines, bringing it very much back to life. Okay. Now, attempting to bridge the gap between the group and the individual notions, two sets of researchers independently proposed an approach that I like to call multi-X. So both groups looked at simultaneously achieving group fairness, but not for a single pair of disjoint sets. Instead, both groups looked at large numbers of potentially intersecting large sets. And in my way of looking at this, uh, multi is, um, sorry, X is, is, is specifying a particular fairness guarantee, for example, uh, demographic parity. Um, whereas the multi reminds us that we're talking about multiple sets that, that may have arbitrary uh, intersection. Um, the first set of authors, 
Hebert Johnson et al. focused on calibration of scoring functions. And that's going to be much of the topic for the rest of the talk. And uh, the other group, uh, Kearns et al., looked at statistical parity and equality of false positive rates. Okay. Now, stepping back a bit, uh, risk predictors assign probabilities or they assign scores to individuals that are frequently interpreted as probabilities probabilities to in, uh, for individual instances. For example, what is the probability that it will rain tomorrow? What is the probability that this person X will repay the loan? What is the probability that this tumor will metastasize? And what is the probability that Y will commit a violent crime? The problem is we don't know what is the meaning of the probability of a non-repeatable event. So what does say the probability that X will repay the loan actually mean? You can't give a loan, see what happens, rewind history, give the same loan, see what happens, rewind history and so on, and come up with a sort of frequentist notion of what the probability of X repaying the loan will be. So what does this actually mean? Similarly, what does it mean to talk about the probability that this particular tumor will metastasize under a given course of treatment? And without an answer to this definitional question, we don't even know what it is that the ideal algorithm should satisfy. What, are the, what is the ideal algorithm trying to do? What are the properties that we want of the numbers that it produces? What is the gold standard, if you will, that we as algorithm designers are trying to achieve? This is literally the defining problem for artificial intelligence. What are individual probabilities? What is it that the ideal algorithm should capture? So one approach is to estimate probabilities for individuals by looking at frequencies of sort of similar people, notably bringing us back to the problem of who is similar to whom or what instance is similar to what other instance. So here, for example, is a tumor. And the question is, what is the chance of metastasis under a given course of treatment? And of course, my numbers are completely made up. So you could imagine that there is a study done of tumors and certain uh, locations in the DNA are, um, are examined for this study and statistics are computed according to this sort of reduced representation, the pink locations. Um, and perhaps uh, in one study, this particular tumor, if we look at the a fraction of tumors that looked like this one in the pink locations, 70% uh, of them metastasize under the given course of treatment. At the same time, it's possible that in a different study that considered only the blue locations and not the pink locations, um, tumors that looked like this one metastasized in 40% of the cases. And with these kinds of numbers, we have no idea what actually is the probability of metastasis for this particular tumor. And note that this example highlights something very important. That is the way in which we represent the tumor to the algorithm in training as well as that test time um, uh, has a very big impact on the estimate that we're going to make or put differently, the representation of individuals in data is a vector for discrimination. It's a vector for the introduction of bias. So representations are very, very important. Uh, and informally in, in this, you know, uh, what, what we have to imagine is that um, say in our talk, X will be the set of all possible real people 
But the algorithm never operates on a whole person. It doesn't have all the information of the person. It only has a representation of the person. So imagine that there's a mapping that takes us from the real world to some representation space. This is what the algorithm sees. The algorithm only knows what it is told about you. And theoretically, distinct individuals could be mapped to the same representation. However, in this talk, we're going to assume that the representations are very rich. There's a lot of information about individuals in the representation. And so we are not going to have to worry about collisions. There's enough information that no two people would be mapped to the same spot. Of course, representations can obscure key information, which is essential for the task at hand, for the, uh, the prediction or classification task at hand. And so um, uh, uh, anything that we do and anything that we say is sort of contingent on the representation being sufficiently rich. Okay. And there's a key open problem, which is to evaluate representations. Uh, their suitability for the task at hand, the way they will or will not introduce bias, as we saw with the tumor example, and so on. And uh, here's a picture of my collaborators on um, the first part of this work. We have Michael Kim, Gal Yona, Guy Rothblum, and Omer Reingold. So here we have a little bit of uh, the setting that we're going to be working in. We have individuals here. And in our training data, the individuals will have outcomes, which will be either, which will be for the purposes of this talk, Boolean outcomes. And so we consider these labeled instances. And then we have a representation mapping, which takes our training data and uh, I mean, our, our instances and maps them into training data. And the representation may obscure key facts about the individuals um, and the labels come along with. Now, in what I'm going to be discussing, I like to think about things as follows. I imagine that for every instance, uh, every person, and whatever it is we're trying to predict, there is a prediction, PI star, which is assigned to the instance by nature. Now, um, and the outcome that, we, that actually happens in nature is a draw from a Bernoulli distribution that has probability or parameter PI star for individual I. Now, there's a, a big debate about probabilities. Not everybody actually agrees that there are probabilities. Some people think that probabilities are, are just either zero or one, that everything is predetermined and, and that things only look random to us because we don't have enough information or enough computing power to actually figure out what the answer, what the outcome will be. Um, this talk is going to be agnostic on this point. That is, if you believe only in integer probabilities, then indeed PI star will be zero or one and the outcome OI star will be whatever PI star is. If you are more comfortable thinking in terms of uncertainty, then this will be our model. Everything we say works either way. I tend to think in terms of uncertainty, but not everybody uh, likes that, okay? I find this convenient. Now, in any case, nature is assigning an out, uh, a probability, PI star, to each individual. And so here's an individual and here's some uh, probability PI star. And then we go and see what happens in the representation. Since there are no co collisions, we can think of PI star as attaching to the representation we have of individual I. Um, and so sometimes we'll talk about the probability of this person in representation space, and it's well-defined because we have no, uh, no collisions. Okay. All right. So what do we want from these probabilities? Statistics has a very large literature on the problem of forecasting with the goal of finding probabilities that somehow or other look right. 
And so a nice way of thinking about uh, that vein of work is to think in terms of weather. So imagine that every night the forecaster assigns a probability of rain the next day. So maybe the forecaster says there will be a 30% chance of rain tomorrow or a 50% chance of rain tomorrow. Now, the calibration condition is often viewed as a kind of sine qua non of forecasting. If you're not calibrated, you're a bad forecaster. So what does calibration say? It says, think about any particular outcome V, that any prediction, uh, predict, particular prediction value V, say 30%. Then if we look at all of the days on which the forecaster predicted a V probability of rain, then in fact, in an infinite sequence, a V fraction of those outcomes should have been po positive. So if we look at all the days on which the forecaster predicted 30% chance of rain, then on 30% of those days, it should actually have rained. And the same thing for the days that the forecaster predicted 50% and so on and so forth. Notice though that calibration does not imply a strong notion of accuracy. So for example, um, if I knew the sort of, uh, the number of days of rain in a typical year, I could just predict a probability of rain that is the same every single day, which is the fraction of the typical number of days of rain per year divided by 365. And this would be calibrated, but um, or approximately calibrated, but uh, it's clearly not very, very accurate. The numbers aren't very accurate or they're not really informative. Now, calibration also makes sense in the batch setting, which is where most of uh, our work is, is situated. So in the batch setting, we have a bunch of uh, labeled representations of individuals, and we're trying to build a predictor, which we're going to call P tilde throughout the talk. The tilde versions are the things that we are building. The star versions are what nature says. So P tilde is the predictor that we want to build. And we wish to train it to map representations of people to numbers between zero and one. And it should have the probability that when we get to actually seeing what happens in real life, we look at the instances uh, to which our predictor is assigning the value V. And in fact, on a V fraction of those cases, we should see a positive outcome. And similarly for any other value W. So it's the same notion, but now we're transferring from the training data to uh, the test data of the future. Okay, so why am I spending so much time talking about calibration in a talk about fairness? I mean, it's true. I started off by saying, what should the ideal algorithm satisfy? And calibration is one of the conditions that has been looked at in the literature. But calibration was explicitly introduced as a notion of fairness in the work of Kleinberg, Malinathan, and Raghavan. So, um, Here's our predictor. We want that it should be calibrated. But in their work, they suggest that they want a kind of bi-calibration. It's a simple version of multi-calibration. We have two disjoint groups and we want that the predictor should be calibrated simultaneously on each of these two different uh, uh, demographic groups. So, Again, the, require, the fairness aspect says that we want calibration simultaneously on disjoint demographic groups. And the intuition for why this should be viewed as a fairness condition is that it says that nobody need second guess the value issued by the predictor according to which demographic group somebody is in. That a prediction value of V means the same thing whether one is a member of group A or of group B. A prediction of 80% chance of success will mean the same thing whether one is a member of group A or a member of group B. 
so that's the sense in which Kleinberg, Molinathan, and Raghavan say that this, this is a um, uh, view of this as a fairness condition. And um, I, you know, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, it's, it's a natural desideratum. Now, in this particular example, just to be clear, I am giving you, here are my predictions for my uh, predictor P tilde. These are the truth, true labels. So I'm predicting three fifths for everybody. And we can see that P tilde is calibrated on the set of all people, but it is not calibrated either on the faculty members here or on the non-faculty. Okay, so it is not calibrated on faculty or non-faculty, but it is calibrated as a whole. So the requirement that we're going to see is calibration on smaller subgroups. Okay. All right, and this brings us to multi-calibration, which is where we're gonna be spending a lot of uh, the rest of the, the, the day. So in multi-calibration, the requirement is that for a possibly very large collection of sets of instances, the scoring function P tilde that we build should be calibrated simultaneously on each of these intersecting, possibly intersecting large sets. Now, here comes what, <laughs> what's been on my mind for a couple of years, which is which sets? Now, I had heard about, about this work, uh, um, you know, 2016-ish, 2017, and it's clearly lovely work, but I didn't fall in love with it immediately. What really, really got my attention was when I was trying to figure out how do we choose the demographic sets? So what bothers me is that when people talk about um, listing demographic groups for which we wish to ensure some kind of fairness, they, you know, they list standard sorts of things. But my feeling is that we're not listing the things that we haven't thought of. So I'm not sure that 10 years ago, we would have thought about including as a set non-binary gender individuals, that our awareness of, of what is the right thing to do and what sets should be considered expands and changes over time. And when we think about sets in general, you also have to think about who needs to make the decision? And in particular, who needs to lobby to be included? So I was at Radcliffe, I was listening to a lecture about a 17th century religious woman who wanted, you know, she had thoughts about theology and she wrote essentially, of course, I have no right to have thoughts about theology because I'm just a woman. And I thought she wouldn't have, you know, uh, agitated for representation because she had somehow uh, taken in the dominant view that women were not supposed to be able to have thoughts about these topics. She had inculcated that and she was confused about it. So such a person would not be in a situation to lobby to have the demographic group of women included in the collection of sets. And we, we don't really know the range of, of these things. So one of the brilliant contributions in the Eber Johnson et al paper is that they say, specify the set collection by complexity theory. So for example, the sets that can all be that can be recognized by decision trees of height six. So this is brilliant because somehow there's no question about who has to think about these, uh, uh, which sets should be included. It's done automatically by appeal to complexity theory. So we're going to come back to this point quite a bit uh, later, but um, I just wanted to really highlight what a wonderful contribution that perspective gives us. 
Now, I should also note that the sets in multi-calibration play two roles, and we'll see a little bit more about this later. Um, uh, one role is to sort of name the groups for whom we should have fairness, but the other role has to do with making sure that the predictor that you actually end up building is, uh, is useful. So we'll come back to that, uh, just a flag. And finally, in multi-calibration, in this whole vein of work, the approach is not aspirational in the sense that at best, we will be getting better and better knowledge about people's chances of success in the real world. But of course, the real world is not the ideal world. And people can be and are oppressed and beaten down and discriminated against and so on. And so knowing the actual success probabilities or probabilities of a positive outcome in, let's say, a very toxic and sexist environment is not the same as knowing the, the chances that one could flourish in a, in a better environment. Okay. All right. So next uh, topic along the title of my talk. Um, randomness and pseudo-randomness. So in a random sequence of bits, uh, there's no pattern to the bits, zero, one, one, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and seeing any prefix, the next bit is still completely unpredictable. Pseudo-random sequences are similar, except that there is a pattern, it's just not efficiently discernible. So there's no discernible pattern. There's no efficient prediction method. Pseudo-random sequences are created by pseudo-random generators that stretch a short, truly random seed to create with no additional randomness, a longer output sequence that sort of looks random. And when we say that it looks random, we have to ask ourselves, looks random to whom? So for example, if there was someone who could sort of had enough time to step through all of the possible short seeds, to that person, the sequence would not look random at all. That person would be able to figure out what is the seed and, and predict the next bit. So the definition in cryptography and complexity theory of looking random is, well, we specify randomness, like to whom we specify via a complexity class. So for example, these could be algorithms that run on a 1980s HP calculator in less than 24 hours, or neural nets of three hidden layers and width 256, or decision trees of height six, or as is typically the case in the cryptography uh, literature, all polynomial time algorithms. And of course, such guarantees uh, will only make sense if it turns out that P and, and NP are, are different. Yeah. So this is the notion of pseudo-randomness. And just as we said before, which collection of sets should we be considering? Here we have which collection of possible distinguishers should we be considering? And it's not an accident that we have to think about those same two things. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of what uh, individual probabilities looking right could mean, this is kind of what was going on in the statistics literature. Uh, we call it prediction indistinguishability with respect to nature. And in order to explain that, I have to just tell you a few things. So first of all, a history is just a sequence of prediction about the first individual and the first outcome. Prediction for the second case, and the outcome in the second case and so on. That's a history. And a distinguisher is a fancy word for an algorithm that takes as input a history and it produces as output either a zero or one. Okay. All right. So one notion of individual probabilities that look right, which we see in the statistics literature, is prediction indistinguishability with respect to nature, which we can now define as follows. We're looking at two possible experiments. In one experiment, we have nature's predictions paired with nature's outcomes. So the prediction for the nature's predictions, remember I said nature assigns a prediction 
And either we, and, and, and outcomes are drawn from a Bernoulli distribution with that probability of a positive outcome. That's what I mean by nature's predictions and nature's outcomes, okay? So in one experiment, we take histories of this form and we feed them to the distinguisher and we get a zero or one. Um, and so we can imagine that we do this experiment repeatedly and we have a certain probability over histories of this type that we get a one as an outcome. In the other experiment, we have nature's, uh, we have the algorithm's predictions and again, nature's outcomes. And we see sort of how well the, the algorithm is doing by comparing the probability with which the distinguisher outputs ones on these kind of these kinds of histories versus the probability of one on these kinds of histories. Ah, just to be sure I should have a better pointer. So predictions here where we, um, probability of one here, where the experiment is over our predictions paired with nature's outcomes versus probability of one here on the left where it's nature's predictions and nature's outcomes. And here's how we denote those. Nature's predictions, nature's outcomes, indistinguishable with respect to our class of distinguishers, um, algorithms, predictions, nature's outcomes. Okay. So suppose we have built our predictor P tilde and we have a distinguisher. Can we actually test to see the behavior uh, of the distinguisher on these two different things? And the answer is no. We can definitely carry out the experiment on the right, but we never have our hands on nature's predictions. That's the problem. We don't even know whether nature's predictions are forced to be either always zero or one, or whether they can actually be numbers between zero and one. So we don't have our hands on P star, so we can never test for this kind of uh, distinguishability. So what we did is we provide a shift in perspective. And instead of looking at the prediction probability that we talked about before, we now, uh, sorry, prediction indistinguishability, we're now going to talk about outcome indistinguishability. And so now our two experiments will look like this. We have our algorithms predictions paired with nature's outcomes and our algorithms predictions paired with outcomes drawn according to the Bernoulli distribution where the probabilities are provided by our algorithm rather than by nature's probabilities. Okay. And it turns out that if we look at, we've changed the problem, but if we look at the cases that the statistician studied, uh, if you can satisfy outcome indistinguishability, in other words, our notion, you will also satisfy prediction indistinguishability, which is their notion. But ours is much more hands-on and we can actually test for it. And so, um, so that, that gives us our, new view of what does it mean for individual probabilities to look right. That outcomes drawn from the forecaster's predictions are indistinguishable from those produced by nature. Okay. Now, there is a wonderful YouTube video of Richard Feynman and he's talk in which he's talking about how do you find a new law of physics? And he says, First, you guess the law. That's where the physics comes in. Then he says, you compute the consequences of your new law. Like, so first you guess it, then you compute, you kind of make this out, compute the consequences. So you try to see if your law is correct, what should you observe? And then you try to confirm this via experiments. And he says, if your predictions don't match up with the real world, then your law is wrong. It doesn't matter how clever you are. It doesn't matter how beautiful your law is. 
if your predictions don't match up with nature, your law is wrong. And he says, in that sentence is the key to the scientific method. So with that background, we think about outcome indistinguishability as being in this flavor. We're thinking of our predictor P tilde as a scientific theory, something that is modeling reality. And so for example, suppose that the class of distinguishers that we consider is the collection of everything that you could do in polynomial time. Then outcome indistinguishability says that the behaviors predicted by the theory cannot feasibly in reasonable time be distinguished from the behaviors of the real world, even when you get access to the predictions. Okay. So this is why we like the notion of outcome indistinguishability. There's no feasible way to falsify such a theory. And to get to the intermediate punchline, you can achieve uh, indistinguishability, outcome indistinguishability. And in fact, once you define outcome indistinguishability, you realize that you get a hierarchy of possible definitions. So here are some, here are some examples. The hierarchy, uh, the levels of the hierarchy are um, vary according to the degree of access that the distinguisher has to the predictor P tilde. So for example, in what we call no access outcome and distinguishability, um, the distinguisher is given an instance and it's given uh, an outcome drawn according to the prediction made by the predictor, but uh, that's it. There's no access other than through that little indirection here of, um, of what P tilde actually was. In sample access, that's closer to what we've been talking about so far. We have our individual, we have the uh, prediction that the algorithm makes for this individual, and we have an outcome drawn according to that prediction um, uh, uh, or according to O star. So, um, but then you could go even further. You could say, for example, that you want your distinguisher to be able to ask not only for the prediction for some individual I or a couple of individuals I that you have handed to it, but it wants to know, it may think of examples and say, well, how would the predictor have behaved on this example? And if I change the example a little bit, then what would the predictor have done? And so you can have Oracle gates for calls to the predictor for you know, P tilde J for arbitrary J that it makes up. And then finally, you could imagine that the distinguisher actually has access to the code itself for the algorithm P tilde. And each of these, levels is more and more power that's given to the distinguisher, making indistinguishability a tougher and tougher goal to achieve. And um, as it turns out, there's a tight connection between uh, what we call no access uh, outcome indistinguishability and sample access indistinguishability to notions from the Eber Johnson et al paper. This lower form is something, turns out to be exactly equivalent to something called multi-accuracy. And this turns out to be exactly equivalent to multi-calibration as we discussed it earlier in the talk. So there's in fact a, a tight connection between the distinguishers that you use in the indistinguishability hierarchy and the sets that you use for calibration. So that question, when we say pseudo random or indistinguishable with respect to a collection of distinguishers, again, that ties very tightly, you know, and, and how do you choose which distinguishers that ties very tightly to which sets do you want for multi-calibration? Okay. Now, it turns out that it's possible to construct predictors whose complexity is independent of that of real life P star. So P star might be super complicated, much more complicated than um, uh, uh, the collection of distinguishers that we have in, um, in our set C. And yet nonetheless, it's possible or there exist 
predictors that are not very complicated that can sort of fool all of the distinguishers in the class C, even when C is very rich. This is true for the two lower levels of the hierarchy. It is no longer true when we get to the two upper levels of the hierarchy. So in the upper levels, things can uh, basically, because we have made the distinguishers so much more powerful, we may have to do a lot more work in order to fool them. So I'm going to switch back and forth between these notions of multi-calibration and outcome indistinguishability because we've seen the very tight connections at, the, at, at level two. And this turns out to yield a very powerful framework. Uh, and it has um, a number of surprising applications, some of which have only um, been published in the last year or so. And I expect there will be a lot more. So for example, Kim Kern Goldwasser, your own Fraka Kreuter and uh, Rheingold um, came up with what they call universal adaptability, which, is, uh, which essentially says that um, if you have propensity score reweighting functions that are captured by your class C of functions, and I know in the past I said first that C was a collection of sets, and then later I said it's a collection of distinguishers, and now it's a collection of functions, but the intuition kind of gets pulled along and it's seriously the same beasts. Um, if you can, if your reweighting functions can be captured by this collection of functions, then you can do a kind of one-time effort, which will enable you later, one-time effort working with some given source distribution to later obtain statistics for many as yet unseen target distributions without any kind of retraining when you, when you actually get to the target distribution. And in a similar vein, Gopal and Kalai, Rheingold, Sharon, and Dieter uh, built something called Omni Predictors, which allow, again, one time training, where the training involves the collection C of functions. Um, and uh, you train once, and then later on, if um, uh, somebody pre presents you with a convex Lipschitz loss function that you have not. Um, been working with in the past, you can nonetheless, with very simple post processing and no retraining, do as well as the best any uh, best and best that any function in the class C could do for optimizing with respect to that convex Lipschitz loss function. And these are just two examples of really surprising things that you can do with this powerful framework. So in the last few minutes, I want to get back to the collection uh, of sets or distinguishers or functions. And I explained why I was so excited about this, that the complexity theory aspect gave me a kind of pan fairness. Any, it's going to be, it's going to be calibrated with respect to any of this huge collection C of sets. Problem is that this kind of pan fairness does come at a price. When you are building the predictor, the kind of makeup of the collection C is very important. And in fact, the complexity of building the predictor depends on something which is called the weak agnostic learnability of the class C. And sometimes that can be NP hard. So there are cases in which there are good heuristics. There are cases in which there are actually good algorithms because the collection of sets has some nice properties. Um, so for example, low VC dimension uh, or um, yeah, so low, low VC dimension would be an example. And that would say come into play with uh, decision trees where the VC dimension is just the height of the tree. But in general, like this incredible, okay, complexity theory is solving my problem for me. That wasn't entirely true anymore. That if I really want all things that can be recognized say by some small circuits, 
there are too many of them. There's not going to be a good heuristic for the agnostic learning problem. You know, it, it doesn't work. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this second point. Okay. So this brings us to what I call the scaffolding set problem. And this is gonna sound completely out of left field, but can we efficiently find a modest sized collection of sets such that if we multi-calibrate with respect to this collection of sets, we'll actually get a good approximation to nature's P star. And if we could do that, that would be great because P star is calibrated on all large subsets. Reality is calibrated on all large subsets. So if we could come close to reality, then that would be fantastic. Of course, you could then say, well, why don't you just try learning P star in the first place? And you know, what's, what's different that's going on? So bear with me for a moment. Um, but the bottom line is that, yes, the answer to the scaffolding set question is sometimes we can do this. And I'll just tell you a few words about that. So there's a folklore that says that the intermediate layers in a neural network may provide high quality representation of the input. And we're going to imagine that we're in a case like this and that there is some kind of a representation that takes our instances presented to the algorithm and further shrinks them down to a, to a low dimensional representation. And we get a theorem that says something like this. If reality can be well approximated by, and here's a picture, a low dimensional mapping composed with a low Lipschitz suffix, then if we have an approximation to that nice mapping, we can solve the scaffolding set problem for P star. Okay. And examples of this would be say general linear models and single index models. And the nice thing is that finding such an H hat can be super easy and a lot easier than actually learning P star. So for example, in the uh, generalized linear models, single index models, and some others, uh, you might even be able to find H hat by ordinary least squares minimization uh, with only a linear model. Or you might be in a transfer learning setting where data for H hat are abundant and there are nice ways of learning. I mean, the whole point in transfer learning is to find good low dimensional representations that transfer. So that gives a prescription, which kind of is the best of both feasible worlds as follows. Suppose you have a collection C for which you have a good weak agnostic learner or a learning heuristic. In other words, the conditions that you need in order to actually run multi-calibration. Then we would add, try to learn a good low dimensional representation where good is defined in this work and build a scaffolding set collection from that. And now augment C with just this small modest collection of additional sets and perform multi-calibration with respect to C prime. Adding sets to your multi-calibration never hurts you. And if you're in the lucky world, which is not so rare in which there is a good low dimensional representation, then you will actually get this kind of pan fairness that uh, so excited me when I first learned about um, uh, multi-calibration. So final remarks, we've discussed outcome indistinguishability as a goal for a meaning for what we mean by individual probabilities. This is a really active area and there's a lot of related work both in theory and in practice. Um, there are a lot of applications even for these lower levels of the hierarchy uh, beyond fairness. The collection of distinguishers matters and it matters and it matters and it matters. And the collection of sets matters because they are acting, they are, they are determining the strength of your fairness, and the, the breadth of your fairness guarantees. Um, uh, there's an open problem, which is that I would love that when that there was a, 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 an algorithm which when somebody says 
here's training data. We want you to build something that is fair in the following ways, that it would be possible to look at this and say, oh my, are you kidding? There's no way I can build a fair mapping, a, a fair predictor based on this. This, this. this representation is using features that mean one thing for group A and a different thing for group B. And this, these data are you know, leading to something that could be expressive for members of A and completely inexpressive for members of B. And this is this question of the data and building on data that are really, really questionable um, is fundamental and needs much more study. And finally, I have hinted that uh, the best all of this work is doing is understanding reality, understanding PSTAR, getting a better handle on PSTAR. And it doesn't tell us how we should fix things, how we should assign scores and admit people to universities and so on in, in, in a way that's closer to the ideal world, which I call Q star rather than P star. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for a very, very great talk, very inspiring. And thanks a lot. And I would love to open the discussion here so you can either i guess unmute yourself if that doesn't work um please post your question in the chat i don't see the youtube channel um probably someone can send me over the messages from the youtube channel but yes otherwise please just unmute yourself and ask the question And if people are too shy, I can ask the first question. Some of my questions you answered at the very end of your presentation. And you said you said one point, you said, I mean, I have multiple points, but one point you said at the end is that this P star is calibrated on all large subsets. Um, that's what you said on, on one slide, I guess. So the, the, the P star is calibrated on all large subsets. I was not fully, let's say, not convinced, so to say, I, I, I don't buy this right away. Um, because I, I had another question, let me directly ask, when you had it, I, I thought you had this example of showing um, these faces and then we have seen it's calibrated on the entire set, but it's not calibrated on the subsets. I was wondering, okay, if we pick more and more subsets, can it be the case that we cannot find a solution at all? Because I mean, on this subset, it might work, on some other subsets, it might work, but and then on the next subset, it doesn't work anymore. So is there a case that we cannot find a solution? And this brings me then to the other question, right? Is it true that the true distribution is always calibrated on all subsets? So um, it really is the case that the true distribution is calibrated on all large subsets by definition, um, because they are, I mean, okay, the definition of calibration really should have had a tiny bit of slack in it. We can't get perfect calibration, but we can get approximate calibration. Um, uh, the slack comes from a few different places, but, uh, sorry, let me just think carefully. If, in reality, for a particular value V, there are only a very tiny few people who have value V, then I don't know. I, excuse me, no, no, I'm sorry. I take it back. It is perfectly calibrated. P star is perfectly calibrated on all large subsets, on all sets, because it, it's, flat out by definition. If we look at all of the, you know, if P star assigning a value V to you means that you really have a V probability, this is your true probability of experiencing a positive outcome. So by definition, P star is calibrated. I bet that part. But isn't it then true that if we have, let's say, a very large collection of sets, then the only solution for this, I guess you call it P tilde, right? So our our distribution. P tilde is different than P star. Yeah, yeah. My, my question is, if, right. my comment is, isn't it then true if we have many large, many, many subsets that the only solution for P tilde to be calibrated on all these subsets is that P tilde equals to P star? I imagine that if you have enough uh, subsets, you do need to get to that point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
That was awesome. Cool, cool. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So, yeah. There is a question in the chat from Lukas Gosch. Lukas, not sure whether you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, I can read your question. I can also oh, unmute okay. myself. Um, thank you very much for the nice talk. I was just wondering, maybe you have touched on it in the talk, how well and under which conditions does this notion of outcome indistinguishability indistinguishability imply or relate to this prediction indistinguishability? Like are the equivalent or can we bound prediction indistinguishability using outcome indistinguishability? Uh, yes, uh, to kind of to both. So in the, uh, in the literature in statistics, the um, things were not quite framed in terms of indistinguishability. They were framed in, in terms of a kind of one-sided quote unquote, passing a test. And so um, the, the, the most of the literature says, if you look at any kind of test that nature's predictions pass, then the predictions of the uh, algorithm should pass that test as well. Now, notice that if we're focusing only on conditions for which nature passes the test, we do know the probability with which nature passes the test. It's one, those are the only ones that we're allowing into consideration. Okay, and so um, in that case, we do know the probability with which nature passes the test, it's constrained to be one or close to one. And now we can, um, um, uh, now, now the two notions of indistinguishability turn out to be uh, almost identical. Um, and in general, we can bound the prediction indistinguishability. Yes, uh, there's some slack that gets introduced. Some, like if you're sort of alpha outcome indistinguishable, then you're, I forget, three alpha or something prediction indistinguishable. Yeah. Okay, I see, thank you very much. And that's in the paper, you can see. Any further questions? I have another one. <laughs> so um, I'm working a lot on graphs. And uh, I, so you said it in the talk as a side remark, I guess you assume that, that the data or the, the instances are independent and the outcomes. Um, do you have any thoughts? This is more like an open question. How can these results transfer to other data regimes where we have dependencies, specific, as I said, like, for example, graph domains where the instances for sure are interacting with each other? Do you have any thoughts on that? Or is it out of, is it infeasible at all to tackle such questions uh, in these scenarios? Fair, let's say fairness, mm -hmm. some simple, simple notions of fairness. So, so you have, you have, you're asking whether there's a fairness notion for graphs or other kind of dependent data. Problem? Yes, exactly. Where we have dependency between, between the instances or between the outcomes, let's say, right? That the outcomes are not independent, but that one outcome for one instance affects the outcome for another instance. I see, I see, I see. So um, in this regime, in the vein of work that I was talking about today, I don't. However, um, in work on individual fairness that I did together with Christina Ilvento several years ago, we did look at situations where, for example, you um, decisions can't be completely independent because there's a cap on the number of uh, um, positive, positive outcomes, like you can only accept a certain number of students, or things get further constrained because uh, half the students that you accept have to be able to pay full tuition or things like that. Okay. And um, uh, the, so, so there, is, there is some study of possibility and impossibility results along those lines, yes. Um, some, some situations are impossible and some are surprisingly possible. Interesting. But uh, specifically about graphs, I haven't thought, or the idea of exactly how people, people's outcomes might be tied together, I haven't thought about, but I think it's a great question. Thank you. Any further questions from the general audience? I, I actually want to mention something. 
Sure, uh, one sure. more thing in response to this. So the notion of individual fairness says that similar people should be treated similarly. This is not the same thing as independence or dependence as you framed it, but sure. it's not, you know, you, you can't treat similar people wildly differently under individual fairness. So in some sense, there's a connection there. I agree as well, yeah, you're completely right. Yeah. Okay, since I don't see any hands, I would uh, say again, thanks Cynthia, for the very great talk. I would love to close the public session now. We will have a fire set chat with a selected group of PhD students. Thanks again, Cynthia. Please stay here in the call for the rest of the audience. And thanks for joining the talk. Thanks uh, for, for all the participants on the YouTube channel. And thanks, Cynthia, again for the great presentation.